Thanks a lot for your kind introduction and the organizers for having me here uh, to speak. And uh, indeed, I will talk today about the, um, the core ADS Cauchy horizon and um, the issue of strong cosmic censorship um, at, at the Cauchy horizon and how, in fact, there is a kind of novel type of instability, a small devices instability, if you have very, very slow decay. And this instability is sort of uh, a little bit complementary also, or in addition to maybe the more uh, known blue shift instability. Um, okay, but without further ado, let's jump directly into the black hole. So we're looking at the, uh, with the first slide at the Kerr black hole, which we know is the maximal um, solution as determined by the Einstein equation with cosmological constants equal to zero arising from uh, those Kerr initial data. So the features are that, well, Kerr is incomplete, so the maximal Cauchy evolution of those data is incomplete. Uh, and moreover, sort of problematic, as was already introduced by Jonathan Luke's talk, in, by, by Jonathan Luke in his talk, that this, um, uh, that the boundary, the future boundary, where the Kerr um, space time is incomplete, has sort of this feature that it's smoothly extendable, and in fact, smoothly extendable in a highly non-unique way. So the infinitely many smooth extensions, which are compatible with the initial data, and the initial data are complete. Of course, if you didn't have complete initial data, then this is trivial. You just have to make it sort of extend the initial data, but here the, the problem arises despite having complete initial data, and that is sort of the problem of um, strong cosmic censorship. Because this would correspond sort of to, to a failure of global predictability of the initial value problem in classical relativity. So now, okay, if you, you say, well, okay, this is a bit strange because the topology of the initial data is like, is R cross S2, that's sort of very unnatural. But in fact, also, it is uh, not so, in recent work with uh, uh, Ryan Unger, we showed that, in fact, sort of those violations of uh, the strong cosmic censorship, uh, in that sense, already occur, uh, also occur in the gravitational collapse picture. So if you have a gravitational collapse uh, of suitable um, um, vacuum initial data, then you can also have that you have a smooth Cauchy horizon. So this is something which is fundamental and also happens in gravitational collapse. Okay. Um, the same issue also occurs if you put a cosmological constant. And in fact, uh, either if in the case of a negative cosmological constant, you have a Kerr ADS black hole, or in the positive, you have a Kerr Desitter black hole. And you also have this problem that sort of uh, this Cauchy horizon is smoothly extendable, and this sort of um, um, gives a problem, let's say, uh, for the point of view of the initial uh, value formulation, or in the case of the negative cosmological constant, in the case of uh, initial value first boundary value formulation. Um, good uh, model case is the so-called Reiser Nordstrom family of solutions, which also admit this feature. There are spherically symmetric charged black holes where charge sort of is responsible, or like takes the role of angular momentum, which gives rise to this uh, Cauchy horizon. Okay. And okay, I've written down the explicit matrix. It's a little bit cumbersome, so okay, you don't have to know this problem less, obviously. So of course, uh, the Kerr solutions in any of the cosmological constant cases, these are very explicit and highly symmetric solutions. So do they re represent sort of what happens in reality? So one way, so one is of course interested, what is the generic behavior? And um, one way sort of to save this predictability of classical relativity is that at least, okay, if you can do it, if you cannot do it for all solution, maybe at least we can do it for generic solution. Sort of this idea uh, was formulated by Roger Penrose that generically sort of regular Cauchy horizons do not exist. And in that sense, sort of at least generically, relativity is, if you want to call it that way, deterministic. But if a bit more precisely, and still not very precise, but a slightly bit more precisely, you can formulate the conjecture, and this was already done also by Jonathan in this talk, but let's do it again. Um, uh, the imprecisely even, that for generic initial data for the Einstein equations, the arising solution is inextendably, as inextendable as a suitably regular spacetime. And to address this conjecture, of course, I have to tell you, well, what do I mean by generic? What do I mean by suitably regular? So the regular and other roles which are very important to addressing this uh, conjecture is that, well, the sign of the lambda, uh, the, the sign of the cosmological constant, whether I look in the, whether I look in the 
linear regime, the nonlinear regime, what is the decay, what are the matter fields, and in fact also whether you take, uh, let's say, quantum effects into account, and we will hear a talk about this also on Friday. Uh, so this is a very interesting uh, and, uh, and rich story. So what's the ideal scenario? What would, would we like to be true as sort of liking to have the, the sort of classical relativity is deterministic? The ideal scenario is, well, if it's sort of, if, um, if the Schwarzschild case is sort of the one which happens. So in fact, that for generic initial data, the Einstein equations, uh, the horizon solution is inextendable as a space with continuous metric. So generically, if the evolution is incomplete, then it is incomplete for good reasons, namely that observers which reach the incompleteness are in fact torn apart by infinitile deformation. And if you sort of integrate Jacobi field twice, sort of at least formally, this would uh, correspond to the fact that the metric, that's sort of the, the uh, that's at the level of this C0 of, of the metric, okay? So if you prove that sort of your metric is, breaks down in C0 like it, does in Schwarzschild, which is the result by Spirsky, then you would have sort of the most definitive resolution of, of the problem. So that would be the ideal scenario. But, and you can also already address this question, not for the full nonlinear uh, non Einstein equation, but rather for the wave equation, which I call now the le, le, the le, le, excuse me, the, le, 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 the le, linear C0 formulation of strong cosmic sensitivity. I'm cheating here a little bit because, okay, actually there's a very sort of huge story behind from weight equations to, to, to Tolkowski equation le, 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 to, le, le, to le, le, linearized gravity and then sort of full uh, nonlinear equation. So I hope you apologize for me calling now the, uh, this sort of the linear C0 formulation of strong cosmic sensitivity. So what's the question now? What's the, how does sort of this uh, formulation translate into the framework of the wave equation? Well, um, sort of the, the C0 formulation would correspond to that solutions to the conformal wave equation arising from generic initial data, and in the ADS case, also boundary conditions. So in this case, and throughout my talk, I will only talk about reflecting boundary conditions. So let's say usually boundary conditions, okay? Um, so for, thus, for such boundary, you blow up in amplitude. And here you should think that, well, okay, blow up in amplitude sort of is a, that the, matter, uh, that the wave equation is not extendable in C0. And sort of this is formally analogous to exactly that the metric is, is not uh, extendable in C0. At the Cauchy horizon for Rice and Nordstrom ADS or Kerr radius black hole. So this would sort of answering this conjecture would only say, okay, this is not the nonlinear equation. These are the, these are sort of the, the, the scalar analog, the scalar, li, 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 the scalar linear analog, and also in the neighborhood of the Kerr radius solution. Of course, where you answer to, where you give an answer to this question then, Okay, you would have to <laughs> understand this in the full moduli space. Okay, so that's the C0 formulation and the li li linear version thereof. So this is okay, now I've already given you bad news. Uh, Jonathan already gave you bad news uh, yesterday, but I'm giving you it again. Namely that, okay, what you maybe like to be true is, is in fact not true. Namely that the C0 formulation of strong cosmic sensitivity is false in both cases where lambda is equal to zero and lambda is positive. And sort of all solutions settling down to Kerr, uh, they are continuously extendable in the interior. Okay, so this is bad news if you would like that conjecture to be true. But sort of there is a revised version which people may be happier with, namely that uh, sort of the H1 formulation of strong cosmic sensitivity, which is something which goes back to Christodoulou. Um, so here that uh, the statement is, well, that it, uh, for generic initial data for the Einstein equation, the horizon solution is inextendable as a space and with continuous metric and square integrable Christoffel symbols. So if the metric is continuous, at least hopefully the, the Christoffel symbols, they blow up in, uh, in, in L2, which would correspond to the H1 formulation of strong cosmic censorship. And similarly, you can ask this question for the wave equation, okay? So solutions to the conformal wave equation arising from generic initial data plus I wrote it already, reflecting boundary conditions have infinite local energy, H1 log, at the Cauchy horizon of, uh, of the Rice and Nordstrom or Kerr black hole. So, um, so as we already learned in, in the talk of Jonathan, is that what's crucial to understanding the validity of those, uh, of those statements, of the, those conjectures, is the late time behavior of perturbations or of the solutions to the wave equation on the exterior of, of the black holes. 
and in fact, both in physical space as well as in Fourier space. And um, uh, to this end, I will now sort of um, outline what is the state of the art, at least for the C0 formulation and H1 formulation. And this is sort of a problem which has attracted lots of uh, people, both in the mathematics and physics community, and by no means I'm giving a complete list here. I apologize for people who I don't mention, but certainly those people have uh, contributed substantial to that, and uh, many more. So as I already said, sort of, okay, maybe let's start from the beginning here. So in those, uh, in the three different cases of the cosmological constant, the decay on the exterior is very different. And this is also, of course, as we learned, very important for the interior problem. In the case of lambda equal to zero, sort of, the, it's a polynomial decay, and uh, yesterday we learned exactly what are the rates. For the positive cosmological constant, it's sort of exponential decay, and for negative cosmological constant, it's only one over log decay for a wave equation, let's say. Okay, let's say for the nonlinear wave equation, as we learned yesterday in Moschidis' talk, this is a different story, but let's talk here first about sort of uh, the lin linear case. So, as I said already, the Z0 formulation is sort of false for the fully nonlinear Einstein equation in those cases. So, in fact, also this was proven before that for the wave equation, this was also disproved. And uh, so we know this is true. At least, however, sort of a H1 formulation is true for, uh, for, the, li, 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 uh, for, for the rise of Nordstrom and also for the Kerr. And there's some recent uh, work by Spirsky proving it actually also for the Tchaikovsky equation. And the hope is that, in fact, one can uh, use that work and, um, and maybe also prove it at least in the neighborhood around Kerr for the uh, fully nonlinear Einstein equation. So that is maybe something which can be done in the future would be extremely interesting problem. The story actually sort of is, is, is also very interesting in the positive cosmological constant case. Well, obviously, the C0 formulation is off the table already because the K is better. However, sort of the H1 formulation may even fail in this case. Why does it, why does it may even fail? Because in the case of positive cosmological constant, you have, a, uh, you have exponential decay, very fast decay in the exterior. And then there's also like an exponential blue shift instability. There is a lot of competition between how solutions settle down in the exterior and um, sort of the blue shift instability in the interior. So this is a very interesting problem and also depends sort of what regularity you choose on the initial data of your solution. If you're sort of in the, if you're happy with a rougher class, uh, then sort of this is true, but if you, then at least H1 blow up holds true. If you really want to impose smooth initial data, then the story is very subtle. And I think we hear more about this in, in Friday's talk and how actually also quantum effects and, uh, uh, may actually rescue versions of uh, the strong cosmic sensory conjecture. And here sort of also very uh, important work by Bashi and, and Hintz. Sort of. um, okay, um, so in the negative cosmological constant, that's what I'm interested in and what I'm gonna talk about today. Sort of there, sort of the story is rather different. And in fact, one sees imminently sort of that the methods of proof, how you, let's say, like, let's say prove those results here, the, C0, uh, the boundedness um, of the C0 formulation, so the violations of the C0 formulation, um, those methods of proof that manifestly fail because they rely on an exterior, exterior decay rate, which is sort of in L1, if you want to say it like this. So in fact, you want that either your exponential or your sort of polynomial with a power bigger than one. And since we only have one over log decay, this manifestly fails. And this is sort of related to the fact that the Kerr ADS exterior is much less stable. And uh, we've, we've heard about this yesterday already for the Schwarzschild case. So this may now give okay, an attractive possibility that in the case of the negative cosmological constant, maybe the C0 formulation may be true after all. And it turns out, which I personally like a lot, that in fact, uh, like addressing this question has now connections to small devices problem and Diophantine approximation. And the re resolution, at least for the, li 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 at least for the linear strong cosmic censorship conjecture, the C0 formulation depends on the exact notion of genericity imposed. So let's start, okay, now I have to do it like this. Okay, let's start first with the H1 formulation because in the ADS case, as I told you already, the decay is slower, so you may be true well, then the H1 formulation should be true. And in fact, this is also something uh, which I proved uh, two years ago, that indeed the uh, generic perturbations of Ryzen-Nordstrom ADS 
uh, scalar perturbation, so solving the wave equation, blow up in H1 log at uh, the Cauchy horizon. So this gives us, uh, this sort of gives us this. So that's happy. So what about this? That was sort of the attractive possibility. Maybe that's even true in this case. So for a riser Nordstrom ADS, sort of despite only this one over log decay and sort of very naive of the, like on the envelope computations may even suggest that you should blow up in, in, uh, in L infinity and in amplitude. Uh, despite this, because there is a certain, um, as I said, you have to understand it both in physical space and in Fourier space. And uh, there's a certain decoupling in Fourier space. In fact, uh, it was shown, uh, I guess I showed in my PhD that um, solutions uh, still remain bounded uniformly in the interior uh, on the Reiser Nordstrom ADS. So, more precisely, all linear scalar perturbations of Reiser Nordstrom ADS, where the initial data are in a, super, in a, su in a suitable Sosobolev norm, um, remain uniformly bounded in the black hole interior and extend, in fact, continuously across the Cauchy horizon, despite sort of decaying. Uh, only one over log. Okay, so this is false. But what about this case? And in fact, in this case, uh, the solution and the resolution depends on, uh, on the Diophantine properties of a suitable ratio of the dimensionless mass and angular momentum. So the cosmological constant consider, uh, introduces the length scale into the problem. So you can either set it to minus three or uh, you look at sort of those renormalized quantities here. So these are actual numbers in some sense, so you can entertain number theoretic properties of, of those numbers. And um, so to state the theorem, I, I have to define sort of the full parameter space of all uh, black hole parameters we are looking at. I mean, we look at all sub-extremal ADS parameters, and moreover, we have to impose the Hawking real bound. If you didn't impose that blocking real bound, then sort of the Kerr ADS exterior already has growing mode solutions. And that way, sort of the exterior is already uh, unstable. So, so this question doesn't make any sense. So, uh, so, this is, so these are, in fact, sort of the full sub-extremal uh, parameter range you can look at, and moreover, sort of in the dimensionless quantities. So the theorem is that, and so, okay, this is, I mean, 22 is the publication date, and in, uh, in fact, two years longer that uh, I've done this. So the linear C0 formulation of strong cosmic censorship is true for bare generic radius black holes. So what do I mean by this, sort of more precisely, is that generic linear scalar perturbations of Kerr radius blow up in amplitude, I will comment on this in a second, at the Cauchy horizon for a set P blow up of dimensionless black hole parameters with the following properties. Uh, P-blow-up is a fractal set. Uh, P-blow-up is dense within, uh, within sort of the full parameter range. P-blow-up is bare generic, it's of second category. However, P-blow-up is the big exceptional. And same in, in this, uh, yesterday's talk, sort of, he was sort of dismissing bare, uh, the big exceptional sets. But uh, for the moment, I like to keep them because, okay, I also believe in bare genericity. Um, I should um, maybe also comment on that point that it would be an extremely interesting problem. Okay, maybe I do this. All right, okay. So it will, I think it's an interesting problem, in fact, because I was stating it that the solution blow ups, blows up in amplitude. So the question is, does it blow up at every point on the Cauchy horizon? So uh, what this shows is that, okay, if you take a sphere, like it's like a Boyle-Linquist sphere going in the, in the, well, in the, actually, in the in, in suitable coordinates, which are regular at the Cauchy horizon, and then you take the infinity norm on the sphere, and then you go to the Cauchy horizon, and then this blows up, okay. It would be very interesting, I think, to understand whether each point on the sphere blows up. But this is a very difficult problem, and in fact, it's sort of, it, it is related to understanding and characterizing nodal sets of, uh, of, um, of eigenfunctions of, let's say, uh, certain types of um, elliptic operator on degenerating spheres. And I think this is a very difficult problem, and, uh, but, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I, well, I can only give you this statement. I, I can also give you an L2, but an L infinity, but I think it, uh, it would be interesting to understand whether each point blows up or what is the set among this, uh, on the sphere for which you have blow up. Okay, so that's the theorem. Uh, that's the, the first statement. So, of course, and this is not yet a theorem, but I hope that my proof convinces you that this should be a theorem, and I should indeed prove it earlier than later. 
that lead, 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 that the lead, lead, that the lead linear C zero formulation of strong cosmic censorship is false for Lebesgue generic Coridius black holes. Uh, more precisely, that all linear scalar perturbations remain bounded, so uniformly bounded in the interior, at the Cauchy Reisenberg set P bounded of, of dimensional black hole parameters with the following properties. That P bounded is the complement of a fractal set that is dense, it is Lebesgue generic, have, has full Lebesgue measure, however, is sort of bare exceptional. Okay. It's the first category. Um, maybe I should sort of mention one thing here. So there are two notions of genericity, in fact, in this statement. So the first notion of genericity is the, the notion of genericity on the data, uh, sorry, well, on the parameters, namely on M and A, and that's sort of the one I was highlighting. But of course, there's also the, the notion of genericity on the, on the solution of the wave equation, more precisely, which on the initial data of the wave equation. And this one has to also take into account. So, so also here, there's a way of making this, uh, giving a precise uh, way of what actually constitutes generic initial data. Okay. Okay, do we have a question so far before I go into how this comes into play? Okay, doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so I will now sort of outline heuristics, which lead to sort of the connection to, to that. And uh, I will, should also stress here, because I think I haven't stressed this previously, in previous talk that actually the actual proof does not sort of go along the heuristics. In fact, I give the, I think there's a nice heuristics which, you, which gives you the connection and then the proof unfortunately does not go via the heuristics, via an argument, I will also comment on that. So for the heuristic discussion, we will assume that the exterior propagation on the black hole exterior is sort of completely governed by quasi-normal modes. So we take a, a solution being a sum, that's an infinite sum of quasi-normal modes. We know that those don't constitute a basis because uh, yeah, that's something we know. But nevertheless, let's do this for a moment for the purpose of the heuristics. So we assume that the exterior is a, is a, is a sum of quasi-normal nodes, solutions on the exterior. And on the interior, um, we will sort of use uh, results with uh, schlappendorf rothman on uh, understanding the, the, the interior scattering, scattering operator from uh, the event horizon to the Cauchy horizon. Okay. So let's first talk about the exterior propagation and we heard a little bit yesterday already. So solutions to the wave equation, they only decay at a one over log rate. And moreover, that log rate is sharp. I should also say if you're happy to lose derivatives, you can improve on powers of log, but well, you cannot uh, gain anything more than that. Um, at this point, I should also mention that actually each in the, at least in the Schwarzschild case, you can project on spherical harmonics. So each spherical harmonic actually decays exponentially, but the, the, the sum of them, the totality of them, only decays one over log. And let's compare this, of course, to the polynomial decay in the lambda equal to zero case or exponential decay in the lambda positive case. And in fact, the slow decay is tied to a stable trapping phenomenon, which we also, which we also heard yesterday of, um, well, of null, null geodesics sort of hugging around the ADS boundary. And because of that stable trapping phenomenon, one can construct quasi-modes, sort of solution to the wave equation up to exponentially sort of error terms, and those give sharp decay. And having those quasi-modes, actually there's, there's a result by uh, Oran Gano, which used the existence of those quasi-modes constructed by Holzsegel Smolevici, from which you then can also infer that in an exponentially close neighborhood, in the sort of large parameter, you have, you have a quasi-normal mode. And, um, and there was also given an alternative sort of classification of quasi-normal modes in the ADS setting by warning. Okay, so what are those quasi-normal modes? Well, they're, at least for the purpose of the talk now, I will think of them as being finite energy solutions of the separated form. Yeah, so you can also characterize them, of course, as poles of a resolvent operator. But the crucial point is that um, they have the following properties, namely that this omega here, the quasi mode frequency, um, is like distributed with the real part, which is like, let's say, constant times L. And the imaginary part is a constant times e to the minus L, okay? So the imaginary part converges as L, which is the sort of the angular momentum parameter, converges exponentially fast to the real axis. And this means that higher angular modes decay slower and slower and slower. 
Okay, and in fact, taking a sum of such an infinite sum of such modes, you could prove that the one over log decay is sharp. Okay, so the slow decay taking quasi-normal modes they're associated to a high frequency phenomenon. L and omega is large. So let's take for the heuristics. Uh, um, uh, let, let's, uh, let's assume that our solution is given by an infinite uh, collection of, of such quasi-normal modes. And in fact, you have to weigh them. And I'll give you now sort of as a black box that if this arises from finite energy, then those weights have to decay exponentially. Okay, so this is, let's say, that's sort of the, let's assume this is our exterior solution. And moreover, we assume now, and this is very false, but it's the heuristics, as I said, that the real mode, that the real part is actually equal to a constant times L, and the imaginary is equal to a constant times E to the minus CL. And those constants only depend on the parameters. This is false, and sort of classically, sort of exactly pinpointing where the quasi modes are, let's say beyond, like really to all the orders, which is important here, not only sort of to leading order in terms of sort of some asymptotic, but in fact to all orders, this is a difficult problem. And in fact, this is why also I, I, I use finally quasi modes. So that's the exterior propagation. So what about the interior? Um, so what's this? How long do I have? What's this? Uh, how long do I have? Do I want to have half an hour? Okay. So for the interior, um, maybe I'll write something. So for the interior, um, the approach is based on a, on a scattering construction from the event horizon to the Cauchy horizon. And the claim is that sort of the scattering operator from the event horizon to the Cauchy horizon is in Fourier space uh, multiplication with a reflection coefficient. So let's see. So, so in fact, if you separate the uh, equation, you have two, you can separate it in sort of the, the non-trivial part into uh, two ODEs, namely the radial ODE, which depends on R, First derivatives of R, second derivatives of R. Then there is a then there's a separation a constant capital lambda. And then there's also the angular ODE. And in the case of uh, in the case of um, of the rise and Ostrom case, the angular ODE is just the ODE for the specular Laplacian, and, uh, uh, which is sort of trivial. But of course, in the case where uh, we have a curved black hole, then this angular OD is highly non-trivial. Because it, it couples to omega, and okay, you really have to understand exactly how the frequency, like what does it do in all the different frequency, um, in the all the uh, different frequency limits which you're interested in. Um, okay, so these are just eigenvalues. Of this. Okay, um, and Associated to, let's say, incoming radiation, we can sort of uh, uh, we can define some certain scattering states, and the scattering on the interior then means that we just have that the scattering state associated to to the event horizon, which I define not as R H R, so we could write it as exact, of course, because this is a second order for the E as a transmission coefficient, which depends on a of omega m and l of the scattering state associated to the left Cauchy horizon. So how much energy gets transmitted through to the left and how much energy gets rec uh, reflected to the right. But of course here, okay, one has to a little bit be careful because okay, they, we separate with respect to d by dt, but d by dt is not, is a killing vector field, that's why we can separate it, but d by dt is not the time like vector field. So if one is more familiar with scattering outside of black holes, one has to be a bit more careful because of the, the time is now in fact R okay, in the interior. And so this is also reflected in the fact that one has only the following pseudo U, 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 what I call pseudo U, 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 U unitary conservation law, namely that it's a, this guy, P squared plus R squared. And now, okay, now I'm doing something. I want to have it more dramatic, but okay, let's make it minus already here. Equals, what did I write it? Omega divided by omega minus omega resonance or omega minus omega minus plus m divided by omega minus omega minus m. So the point is that in the black hole interior, if you do a scattering construction, 
then you have that, okay, from sort of basic conservation laws that T squared minus R squared satisfies the quantity. In the black hole X here, you typically have T squared plus R squared, then Schwarzschild equals one. So that's very nice because a priori you get boundedness of those guys. But now you have this pseudo unitary, and in fact, it turns out that um, the scattering coefficients T and R, they have, okay, here you can already see they have poles, oh, excuse me, exactly at the zero frequencies associated to the, to the killing generator of the um, Cauchy horizon, okay? So in the charge scale field case, it's a little bit different, but um, the upshot is that in fact R, the reflection coefficient and the, both actually R and T, they have, uh, they have a pole uh, at, the C, 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 at, the C, at the zero frequency with respect to the generator of the Cauchy horizon. And this pole is, is very crucial if you have, um, so you don't see this pole, if you have data, essentially you don't see this pole, if you have data on the event horizon, which is in L1. Okay. If the data fails to be in L1, then you see this pole. Okay. And in fact, we are in one of, uh, we only decay one over log, so we in fact see this, uh, have to take account um, this pole. Okay. Um, I should also note that sort of their the interior scattering problem sort of has in fact some history already going back to Turner, Sikar, and Hardo. Uh, not that poll though, but um, um, but also more recent uh, Hefner, Mokdad, and Nikola have studied the, the Dirac equation on the interior of, uh, of black holes. One final word to the scattering poles because I think they're very cool is that, um, I mean, there could be that they conspire to actually not have the pole. And in fact, if you look at the Rice and Nordstrom solution, no cosmological constant, no Klein Gordon mass, and then you, uh, you compute those transmission coefficients, they don't have a pole. And this is sort of a non generic feature, and this is sort of some algebraic miracle, because you can solve sort of the, uh, the radial ODE in the interior um, explicitly, and you can see that despite oscillations and sort of regular singular points and the endpoints, uh, a bounded solution coming from one end actually maps to a bounded solution to another end. This is, of course, a non-generic behavior. The moment you perturb this, uh, you excite that pole. And so if you have a cosmological constant, if you have Klein-Gordon mass, charge, rotation, then you actually do see those poles. For the rotation, it's very easy to see the poles because you can already see that if those are analytic... Uh, uh, well, okay they, okay, they can only be analytic. They can only have a pole at omega equals minus m and otherwise not. And, since they satisfy this condition, you can already see that they have to have a pole. Okay, so that's what I say about the, the scattering problem. And in fact, you want to use those poles and do some sort of principal value computation or a little bit of harmonic analysis. And this uh, can already give you, at least in the, in the case of uh, the chart scalar field, which I look here because there it's sort of uh, where it's easy to write down. You can write down a certain, um, at least up to error terms, and uh, you can write down almost like a uh, like a representation formula of the leading order of C at the Cauchy horizon. And exactly because if you renormalize the coefficient, let's say R, the reflection coefficient as R divided by omega minus omega s. So sort of if you just look at the renormalized coefficients, you can. Sort of imminently see that this little r is an anal analytic function. And uh, so this is exactly this here. And sort of exploiting that pole and exactly computing this Fourier integral, then you can convince yourself that at least the leading order, such a representation formula holds true. Okay. And here you also see that if C on the event horizon is not in L1, then this may actually lead to blow up. In fact, if that is integral, is, is infinite. However, if, if it sort of oscillates sufficiently to cancel this oscillation, then this could still be finite. Okay. So in fact, you have to understand both whether, if you're not in L1, you have to understand both, uh, you, you have to understand whether you oscillate with the resonant frequency of the uh, associated to the Cauchy horizon. Okay, so I've said a lot of things now, and uh, I'm sort of wrapping up, I'll go to the next slide. So on the rise and Nordstrom ADS black hole, I just say now that the reflection coefficient is one over omega. In this case, there is no rotation. Plus, okay, rest, which we forget about. And moreover, I set this little mass frog R, let's say for the heuristics to be equal to one. 
So then we know that uh, we have that C is a, is a sum of course normal modes from the exterior where this decays exponentially. And from the scattering map now, because we actually are already in Fourier space, we just have to multiply each of uh, each quasi normal mode on the event horizon with one over omega uh, at the Cauchy horizon. And then at the Cauchy horizon, we then get this formula. So we, we just multiply each quasi normal mode with sort of the, the worst term, which is one over omega. So one divided by this. And then we get this formula at the Cauchy horizon. Okay. Now, okay, let's take the L2 norm for the moment, computing a little bit. Uh, at least sort of this boils down to, to this sum. And remember that AML does decay exponentially. That's what I gave you as a black box. You have to believe this for me for the moment. Um, and, uh, and then you have like these turn denominators. But the nice thing is that they, okay, this exponentially is, is very small. And for large L, and that's sort of the, the, the important region, um, there's something only for large L. This is actually growing, okay. So this means that that, that that sum is very nice and it's, it's very finite, there's no problem. And the reason is that the exterior quasi-normal modes, which maybe give rise to the slow decay, they are actually um, high frequency phenomenon. So omega being very large. And the scattering poles in the interior, if you don't have rotation, this is only at omega equals zero. So, so in Fourier space, sort of those two problems, which may give rise to instability, they actually decouple and we have uh, stability and in fact, boundedness, okay. So despite sort of the slow decay, we get boundedness for rise and Nord stream radius. So what about the Curie ADS scenario? And there it becomes of course more interesting because the reflection coefficients in fact don't lie at omega equals zero. They don't have a pole at omega equals zero. They have one over omega minus omega minus n, okay. So those poles, they lie on the integers sort of, uh, well, well, M is an integer because it's the S in Uthel mode, and the poles lie at omega minus times n. And that is much more interesting now. So again, we take a sum of quasi normal modes. Now this is a bit more complicated and to justifying actually whatever representation formula you have, this is yet another difficulty, but I'm putting this under the rug now. Um, we now formula, formally multiply each quasi normal modes exactly by one over this pole, and for omega, we again plug in the quasi-normal mode frequencies we get from the exterior. So then, however, because you have also this minus m, then you have this denominator, okay? Then you have AML decays exponentially, but you also have that this denominator can in principle be small. Let's say this is actually, this decays exponentially, so forget about this. So there you have C times L minus omega minus times m, okay? And in fact, m and L, they're both integer values. So in principle, this can be very small. And the question actually, uh, the quasi-normal modes, uh, they now couple to the C C to the C C to the C C to the C C zero frequency poles in the interior. And there's blow up exactly if the denominator, which is this, and I forgot about the exponential thing here, if this goes to zero faster than AML goes to zero, okay? And this is a, literally a question about biofantine approximation, okay? Um, so, Recall AML goes to zero exponentially, blow up if this guy is smaller, let's say one over e to the L, e to the M for infinitely many ML. Well, why infinitely many? Well, you only need infinitely many because then you can put your data supported on all of them. And when they're infinitely many, then, uh, well, your sum blows up, okay? So the sum now reduces, or like the question now reduces to the following statements about the numbers M and A, so the, the renormalized mass and and uh, like the dimensionless mass and the angular momentum, so the weather, that ratio, so now I divide by C and divide by M, so whether that ratio omega minus divided by C, this is only something which depends on the black hole parameters, whether this can be approximated by L over M, which is a rational number, uh, at exponentially sort of a rate, infinitely many, uh, for infinitely M and L. Okay. So this is literally a known sort of set in number theory with sort of an exponentially Liouville numbers, and they have exactly the, the phenomenon, or like they have, they're of the type that they're bare generic, but the back exception, okay. And while you can also entertain their fractional dimension and so on, if that's something you, and the house of dimension, which people study a lot in this literature, but uh, let's not do this for the moment. Okay, so this is the heuristics. Unfortunately, the heuristics is, uh, is not exactly what we do in the paper, but rather, I want to now comment sort of on the actual proof. Uh, 
what we do. So in the actual proof, sort of the frequency analysis is purely based on the real axis for several reasons. And instead of, and we use quasi modes instead of quasi normal modes. And we swap sort of the rows of, of uh, what I say in a second. So the quasi normal frequencies, as we all know, they're sort of complex poles of suitable exterior resolvent. And after Carter separation, they, they are then complex poles of one of the Ronskin, or, uh, uh, or if you want, here zeros of this sort of Ronskin. And the quasi normal mode frequencies, however, they're not zeros of the Ronskin, but they're rather they're regions where the Ronskin is exponentially small. If you want, where the resolvent is sort of very big, namely exponentially big. And this is, in fact, an open condition. Okay? And we use that open condition exactly because you have to play a little bit with the parameters. Um, so now in the heuristic discussion, we sort of inserted the quasi normal mode frequencies, which we assumed to be exactly what they are, in fact, which we assumed to be whatever they were, into the interior scattering poles. And the small devices now arose from exactly this one over omega n minus l minus omega minus n. In the actual proof, however, we insert, we do the opposite. We insert the scattering poles of the interior into the inverse Ronskian. And we have to understand, let's say, the inverse Ronskian exactly at the interior scattering pulse. We have to understand the resolvent, the exterior resolvent in the in sort of a neighborhood of, uh, of the interior scattering pulse. And sort of to justify this, okay, one has to sort of use hard approximations of solutions to, to those type of ODEs and approximate them sort of with uh, well, W could be area of Weber and the parabolic 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 cylinder functions in sort of suitable uh, semi-classical limits. Um, the deal fan time condition in reality, unfortunately, is not as nice as, okay, I wrote it on the, on, the, on the previous slide, but actually, I think, sort of the leading term, and there are sort of other things, but the, the leading term is that the set blow-up is characterized through the set that the, the Ronsky at the resonant frequency is actually exponentially sort of uh, exponentially small for infinitely many ml. And this is actually something which is nice because there, this is an open condition, for instance. So if you want to show bare genericity for those type of things, you, you, you want to have a little bit of room. Okay, so this is so much for the actual proof. Um, so to sum up, um, I personally sort of like the most sort of the curve problem where it's true or false, and in fact, sort of proven to be true for bad generic black holes, and still yet, okay, it's a conjecture, but I, I hope that I'm con convinced you that exactly whether those two, let's say, if you want, the quasi-discrete sets on the interior, which are on a sort of, which are discrete sets going to infinity, and then the X here, which is sort of the quasi-normal mode spectrum, whether they are sufficiently resonant infinitely many times, this is sort of a diophantine condition. So it is conjectured that for the Lebesgue generic case, they are not sufficiently resonant, and it would be false in the Lebesgue generic case. Well, the fully nonlinear problem, okay, that's completely open and much easier questions, let's say, uh, which were already addressed by uh, Mosidis yesterday, uh, they're, uh, they're very difficult, and uh, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to, to see whether, uh, or like, what is finally true, and uh, whether Lebesgue or Bear generic, and uh, sort of the, is it true of a notion of genericity or maybe not? Um, but yeah, even sort of the, the black hole parameters and the nonlinear set set sets and the nonlinear set setting are not, they're not the same, they're not a constant, but they're dynamic. So, okay, whether, and both of sets are very dense, so okay, it's very unclear what happens. Um, okay, uh, how much time do you have? Oh, 10 minutes, okay, that's a lot of time. Okay, I didn't cancel it. So, I will also present the last sort of uh, some, some other work which sort of crucially sees the slow decay four, and four minutes. Four minutes? That's perfect because <laughs> four minutes, that's great. So, so this is now some nonlinear model where you also see the resonances, the interior scattering resonances. So this is the model where you look at the spherically symmetric Einstein equation coupled to Maxwell, Klein-Gordon, uh, and moreover, we assume that the matter is, uh, um, that the solution is charged. And we, uh, we look at sort of only the interior problem. We assume that the characteristics settle down to a rise Nordstrom event horizon and sort of at the conjectures, conjectured decay rate. And the conjectured decay rate is a feature that the scalar field is V decays like polynomial 
but not in L1. Okay, so it's V to the minus S, in fact, sort of like V to the minus five, six. But uh, the crucial point here is that, uh, that that phi is not in L1, okay? So in fact, this means that the, the interior scattering poles, they're important. Okay. You don't sort of, they're not sort of, uh, um, you, you, they're, they're, well, they're not just constant here. And of course, compare this to the polynomial phase, which are bigger than one, and sort of in, in, in Jonathan's talk. And in the in the in the linear scattering theory, I told you that phi at the Cauchy horizon, sort of at least in principle, uh, order is given as exactly that integral. Okay, and in fact, we can actually prove in joint work with uh, Van der Mortel that. Um, and he has actually done much more than okay what I'm presenting now. So he's, a, he's an expert in, in sort of uh, looking at, at the system and, and spherical symmetry. But we have shown that in fact, uh, and based on previous work of his, that in fact if this integral here on the data on the event horizon, which we assume for the nonlinear model, if this integral is finite, then the dynamically the Cauchy horizon exists, and moreover it is C zero extendable. So in fact, sort of if, if, if two is generally finite, then okay, the C0 strong cosmic censorship um, would be false. And of course, it is also interesting, and this is uh, some work we will hopefully put out soon, that indeed, if this is infinite, so if, if your uh, decay rate on the exterior is actually resonant with the interior uh, scattering poles, then in fact, there's sort of a very weak C0, well, in some sense, uh, C0 instability, or in a certain way you're C0 extendable, but in a certain in double null gauge you're not. And um, sort of this is also something which I wanted to say. And uh, well, and uh, well, this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>